If you have your Bible, Hebrews chapter number 1, I believe it will be on the screen as well, but Hebrews chapter 1, just read a couple verses to start from this passage. Talk about the one who is seated, the one who is seated. And that's not you yet, right? You're still standing, but Hebrews chapter 1, thank you for standing, honor God's word. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Skip on down to verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so we're going to talk about uh, the one that sits on the right hand of the Father. Let's be seated. We'll bow to pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for the invitation to come into your presence through prayer. Thank you for the um, uh, salvation that you provide through Jesus that allows us to come into your presence. God, I pray that you'd give me wisdom. <clears throat> I lack it as a person. I lack it as a preacher. And for the uh, point in time... Uh, at hand, I sure lack it, and I ask that you would deliver it to me to be able to express and expound and, and uh, um, preach on these, these verses today. God, thank you for uh, this place that you've assembled people. Thank you for the building we get to assemble inside of. And I pray that if there's something that could be accomplished, salvation, um, just seriousness or dedication, uh, that, that there be liberty for those decisions to be um, understood and felt, and then there'd be commitment and then being made. Uh, we are grateful for what you've already done. We're expecting what you will do. And Lord, we'll be patient and uh, enduring in the time in the middle uh, that we live in the present. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1 uh, it introduces us to the subject of really the whole book. It's the one that's, uh, that's Jesus Christ. It's to convince the Hebrew reader or those that were uh, somewhat involved with um, Judaism that Jesus is the answer. He's our high priest. <clears throat> he is the fulfillment of the, the Melchizedek priesthood and all kinds of things that are covered in the book of Hebrews. In, in uh, just verse number four, you see he's made better than the angels, and that's a theme that runs throughout the book. I'm not going to do every, every chapter, obviously, but uh, the... The, the theme of he's better than the angels, he's better than Moses, he's better than the law, better than the sacrifices, and better than the priest, and he's even better than the innocent blood of Abel. Jesus is uh, better in all those scenarios and all those comparisons. Uh, it, it's interesting when we think of that word better, and not that the Old Testament is not good, it's just the New Testament is better. It, it's the uh, better promises, a better priest, and a, a better... Um, plan that's now complete. The law gave us the uh, gave mankind the lead up to the Messiah, and now the Messiah is here. It's better. The shadow is not better than the thing that's casting the shadow from, and and Hebrews <clears throat> goes into uh, detail and proofs and Old Testament uh, quotes to uh, uh, convince the reader that Jesus is enough. And in verse number three we see some things about who He is. It tells us in verse 2, it's talking about His Son, by whom everything was made. And then it says in verse 3, the Son, who is the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person. That brightness of the Lord is seen in other places as well. He's called the light of the world. It says that uh, um, in, in the book of John, chapter 8, He's, he's the light of the world. It tells us that you've seen Him, you've seen the Father, and, and God is light, Scripture tells us. In fact, 1 John says you can't, you can't claim to have fellowship with God and be walking in darkness because if you're close to God, God is light, and there will be no darkness around Him. 
Uh, just the illustration to uh, that you can assess and know where you're at. Yesterday, one of the kids' games, they were trying to put a, a, a basketball on a, on a picture blindfolded, and a couple of them cheated. I knew they did, I could tell. But uh, they're feeling around, it's dark, they don't know where they're going. Well, uh, for a Christian, if you don't know what steps you're taking, you're not close to God. You're in darkness because God's light and He illuminates everything around. And so verse number 3 introduces us to the one that's seated on the throne as a light. A light that shineth in dark places, that John chapter 1 tells us. And, and this is who this Jesus is. Verse, the thir- verse 3 tells us, that uh, not only is the brightness, he's the express image of the person of God. If you would want to know what God looks like, he looks like Jesus. Jesus is the express image. The Bible says we are made in the image of God. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, uh, as far as humanity is concerned. But in the, the general image, that's what uh, we are formed like. And so Jesus is the express image. And then it says it upholds, upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus is who, how is the power, and Christ possessed all power of God. In Matthew he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he uh, instructed the disciples to go out and preach and, and to make disciples. But the power of God was in creation. The power of God is experienced in salvation. The power of God will be fully realized in glorification. When we get to heaven, we'll understand all the power of God. And and this verse mentions that. Then it tells us what he's done. And it took all of his power. Look at verse 3. It said, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so Jesus, with his power, purged our sins, And now we see him seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we read a couple of the verses about him being seated, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. We'll cover that in just a little bit. But I want you to to get this idea uh, clearly that this is a powerful theme, that the Lord Jesus is seated on the throne. When you take a seat, there's there's a couple reasons it happens. Uh, at the end of the day, you might take a, a seat when you're done with your work. Or, if you're like me, when you get a little tired, you look for a chair. Me and Courtney, we went to Lowe's the other day to get some ferns. And uh, we were walking through, and they just shut down the outside entrance to Lowe's for the flower place. So we parked, and we are going to walk through the center. And uh, she said, they're over here. And as we started to make our way to that that uh, um, green area where the, all the flowers and everything you can, you can part, purchase and buy, I noticed there was some lawn furniture calling my name. <laughs> and as we walked by, I just sat in one of the rocking chairs. She said, you're not going up. I said, I'm sitting right here. <laughs> and it was a dangerous thing to let her go shopping by herself, okay? But I thought, I can't move. And two people came out and they said, those are comfortable, aren't they? I'm like, yep, my wife's shopping and I ain't stopping. Right here, I'm sitting right <laughs> I'm just rocking. And, and I sat down, not because I was done with the work, but I was tired of the day, and I needed to sit down. I don't think Jesus sat down because he was tired. Does that make sense? I don't think Jesus sat down because uh, he was uh, overexhausted with purging our sins. Now, not to minimize what he went through and the endurance of the cross and all the shame and all those things that he, that he suffered, but I don't think Jesus got tired. No, I think that there's another reason why he sat down. I was talking uh, with uh, a fellow who was at the early service and this week, and he mentioned that, um, that, that, that one of the sermons about the Lord being seated just was very powerful to him. And I, I was kind of contemplating some different thoughts of, of what a, to preach this Sunday. And, you know, I think if, if a guy remembers a sermon from years ago, it must have been a really good sermon or a really good subject. I can tell you the exact sermon, 1997, in between uh, uh, when, when uh, um, I was a freshman going to a sophomore in college, I can remember the exact sermon Dave McCracken preached when I knew I was being called to preach. I can tell you the exact sermon Kelly McInerney preached before McCracken preached the day I was being called to preach. I can take you to the passage, give you some of the points. It's clear. I can't tell you very many sermons that Preacher McInerney preached in between. 
And I can't tell you everyone that Brother McCracken's preached in between. He's been here every couple years. But there are certain things that when you're in tune with God or when God is trying to get your attention and you just don't forget. And so when I was talking with Andy this week and he said, man, that's a powerful sermon. I'll never forget what I heard about him sitting down. And I thought, well, it is a powerful sermon, and we're going to do it again today. Amen. So there, here's the seed thought for the sermon. In Hebrews 1, why does he sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high? Number one, he sat down so he can be seen. He sat down so he can be seen. The work is done. It's complete. And it's now seen that he is evidently done with the purpose he came to earth And when he ascended on high, offered the blood, he's seated at the right hand of God. When we go to events and we get tickets to a seat, we like to get a ticket so we can see the event. Have you ever looked online and you're buying tickets and all the tickets are $90 and then you find this one seat that's $15 and you're like, that's my ticket. And you buy it and then you're right in front of a pole when you get there. And you're like, that's why it was $15. Now I know. At their old building, we used to have poles, and people would sit behind them so they couldn't be seen by me. (laughs) I know you did that before. And when you did that, I just preached from over here. That way I could still see you. Uh, But we usually talk about seats so that we can see. But I believe that the Lord Jesus is seated so he can be seen. And he was seen in Scripture Go back a couple places. Hold your place in Hebrews. Go to Acts chapter 7. Show you a few places where this was seen and and just make uh, some comment on it. Acts chapter 7, there are 60 verses. Don't get worried. Don't get scared. We're not reading through all of them, but they are the defense of Stephen, one of the first deacons in Scripture in front of uh, the Jews around Jerusalem that arrested him. It wasn't very long after Jesus resurrected and the church began to have influence and grow and have a doctrine that was being shared and shown that those that opposed it didn't like it. And they wanted to do something about it. Um, I'm always careful uh, with my um, disgust at our culture because... Censoring is not the answer when it comes to truth. Sharing and debating is the answer when you've got truth. And so uh, there are times when I think that we need to make sure that that we're careful with kids because they probably can't uh, uh, handle arguments or understand debates of that nature. But when it comes to uh, different topics and different uh, practices and beliefs, I I don't want to censor. I I think we ought to just bring it out in the open because the truth is the truth and it will defend itself. Uh, We've got the truth. I'm not scared about it with other beliefs and other other, uh, conflicts. um, uh, There there was something a a week or two ago about the Marysville Library. I don't know if anybody heard about that. There was supposed to be some some tarot card reading going on and they had a special class they were offering for kids. And, and there, was, there, was some, there was some pushback, and, and so I, I just messaged the library and said, hey, can I teach a history of the Bible class at the library, since they're going to have a history of tarot reading class at the library? And they said, well, we're looking into that, but we got a professor in mind. I said, well, I would be glad to do it for free. Or I said something like that, and, and they said, well, do you have uh, some slides? And I, and I, but then after they canceled it from the outpouring of, of objection in the town, they said, well, we really don't want to have any religious things. And I said, well, as long as you're not going to have any, but if you're going to have one, you need to have all of them. Yeah. Or at least make it available so we can also teach the, the truth uh, from the Bible. Amen? So anyway, just, just if you ever know, uh, I, I'm not going to have uh, necessarily... Uh, a protest against other people's freedom of religion. I just want to have a debate with their freedom of religion so we can get to the truth. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is given his defense. That's where that little thought came from. And 60 verses of it uh, give the whole story. But in verse 51, here's what he gets to say. And, and probably Stephen would have been a preacher had he uh, lived any longer from his deacon experience. He said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. That sounds like a Baptist preacher, doesn't it? (laughs) And your ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Boy, he's a preacher. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? 
And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who hath received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. They might have been a little angry at the message that Stephen preached, as he was very pointed. He was telling them, this is no different than what has happened in the past with the people that you believe are prophets, they were killed. They were refused, and the Holy Ghost gave them their message, and the Holy Ghost is the one that anointed Jesus and called him, and you need to quit being stiff-necked and accept the truth. That, that's the, the Jeremy-style commentary, okay? Well, look at verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus, look what he saw, standing on the right hand of God. So Stephen got to personally see Jesus at that throne. Now, he didn't see him seated. And it wasn't that Jesus got up to do more work, because he'd purged our sin, he'd paid the price, but for some reason Jesus was, was seen standing and I, my opinion, I just think he's looking over just to see what's going to happen. Not that he was unknowing or ignorant, but it got him to stand at attention. The other thing that I think that, that could be why is Stephen, Stephen died very, very graciously and very faithfully. He said, Father, forgive them as they were throwing rocks at him. You know, that's what Jesus said when he died on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know I don't know if I'd be forgiving people while they're rocking me to sleep. Not in a Lowe's lawn chair rocker, okay? They, they're throwing rocks, murdering, martyring him, and he's saying, Father, forgive them. What it shows me is when you got your eyes on Jesus, you can do a lot of things that you normally couldn't do. A ton of things that in your own power you'd never be able to do. Stephen was just telling him, you stiff-necked! You're rebellious, you horrible people. Lord, forgive them. <laughs> forgive them while they're hitting me and, and killing me. He got a glimpse of Jesus and it allowed him to do something. He personally saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Can I tell you this? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Whether you see it or not, <clears throat> but I believe all of us need to get a personal, a personal sight of Jesus on the throne, seated, because that means the work is done. Um, my mother uh, texted me this morning. She's praying for me, and then she even threw in Will and Brian in the prayer. Now, they always need prayer because they're around me, right? But my, my mom prayed that and then texted me, and I, I thanked her and uh, uh, loved my mom, great lady. But I remember early on at Mount Orb, uh, really, even probably before I was uh, aware of church things and church themes and church doctrines, <clears throat> and I, all I remember is I went to church and, and uh, played around the kids, and my mom would go on visitation on Thursday, and we would stay and play and wrestle and goof off while the ladies would go make some visits, and then th that was just a, a weekly event before, before I was very old uh, in school, and, and then I got a little older, and I knew my mom, she would tell the story that she struggled with believing she was really saved. Like, she had doubts about her eternal security, if she was really saved or not. And she said that when Preacher Smith came, Preacher Smith just bluntly told her, Oh, Dottie, you just got to believe it and get over it. And she said, that, that like offended me, that he could just take that so simple and just act like it was no big deal and just believe it. I've been struggling this for years. And he just says, Oh, Dottie, you're either saved or you're not. You need to believe it and just get over it. And she said, You know what? I finally just had to believe it and got over it. That, that's what happened. I finally just believed that God saved me and that he's not going to let go of me because he paid for all my sin. And this, this view of Jesus seated should show you that all of your sin is paid for. He purged all your sin, the Bible says in Hebrews 1.3. That's why he could set down. His purpose was to seek and to save the lost. And after that was accomplished and the, now the entrance is open so that no one has to be lost, he can sit down at the right hand of the Father. Stephen saw it. Go back to Psalms chapter 110. Psalms chapter 110. If you ever wonder what a good passage of Scripture would be to study or to preach or to share, 
Uh, Psalms 110 was prophetically given to David. Jesus rehearsed it in, front, in the uh, ears of the, the Pharisees and those who were against him. Peter preached it in, in uh, uh, Acts chapter 2. And Paul, if he is the author of Hebrews, which I believe so, uses it in Hebrews chapter 1. This must be a pretty important passage, okay? Uh, Jesus preached it. David got it. Peter preached it. Paul used it. it this is a powerful passage. Psalms 110 says, verse number 1, The Lord, notice they're all capital letters, The Lord said unto my Lord, capital L, small letters, Sit thou where? At my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. David saw Jehovah, all capitals, speaking to Adonai, the, the Lord Adonai, we believe Jesus, and saying, sit thou at my right hand. Jesus wasn't sitting in the Old Testament. Jesus was making appearances uh, in pre-incarnate personages in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Jesus came off the throne and was born as a baby in Bethlehem. Jesus suffered and died and, and, and walked a perfect life. He was not seated in David's day, but David prophetically saw him seated. That's pretty important. David was given this view thousands of years before Jesus, thousand years before Jesus was ever born, that there's a view of God the Father and God Adonai, God the Son, talking, and, and he was in, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write that passage. Stephen saw it personally, David saw it prophetically, and then go back to Luke chapter 22. The enemies of Christ saw it and got their proof they needed. Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, the trial of Jesus, before he's sent to Pilate, and then off to Herod, because Pilate heard he was a Galilean, so hey, I don't have to mess with him. Herod's in town, let's let Herod hear him. And oh, Herod was excited to hear him, and actually Herod and Pilate were at odds, but they became friends because of Jesus being their common enemy. Uh, problem at that day. Luke 22, verse 66. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests, the scribes, came together. They led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. He said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man, what's it say? Sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? He said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. We got the proof. He's claiming to be the Son of God. He thinks he's going to sit at the right hand of God. That's enough to, to charge him with blasphemy. And they took him to uh, Pilate to try to make him uh, be crucified. And so, watch. Stephen saw it personally. David saw it prophetically. And when the enemies heard about him sitting at the right hand, that's all the proof they needed to know who Jesus claimed to be. <clears throat> In a world where there's a constant uh, argument about Jesus, I hope that you will not be confused by other religions' claim Jesus did claim to be God. Jesus was crucified and charged with it because he claimed to have authority and right to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. The Jews knew what that meant, and uh, they understood that it was, it was Christ, God in flesh, that he was claiming to be. And so, number one, why is it important that he's seated? Because he is seen, and that it's evidence of who he is. Second of all, it's important that not only was he seen, that he was seated. Go back to Hebrews 1, if you held your place there. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3. We read it, but look at it a little closer, the, the middle part. After it talks about the word of his power, it says, <clears throat> When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You're sitting in some chairs that came from Wilmington Bible Baptist Church. 
I worked there from 2002 through 2007, and we got to move 750 of them bad boys all the time. And uh, they had an auditorium that was a gymnasium, and so we would take them down to play basketball. We'd take them down for dinners. We'd take them down for this and for that. We'd move them around. We all had little dollies, and that was the, the, the constant activity of the church was to, to uh, stack up and move chairs. So I tease and tell people, I've been moving these chairs for 22 years, right, all, all the time. But Will worked at Wilmington for a summer, and he tells the story of the one day he had to move every 750 chairs by himself. Now, don't let him glory in it. He'll, it gets bigger every time he tells it. I mean, it might be 1,400 chairs by next week when he tells the story. But I know that I was probably somewhere on my phone, right, Brother Mike Wallace? And the other preachers must have had something doing. But Will's like, oh, yeah, I know these chairs. I had to move every single one of them to set it up. He did it all by himself. Now, you would say that may be the reason he would sit down, because if you move 750 of them, you're probably tired. No, Jesus purged our sin because he's the only one who could do it by himself. Not only is he the only one that could do it by himself, there's no one else that could help him even if they wanted to. Would you catch that point today? You will never pay for any of your sin. You will never be good enough to gain any of your salvation. You'll not be good enough to keep any of it because he did it by himself. That's why he's seated. And it's important to see that he's not walking around, looking around for some other offering to make in front of God. There are no other offerings. He is the offering, and that's why he's seated. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it is accomplished. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Well, that was a really loud point. You've got to have some more proof of that, preacher. I'm getting to it. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse number 10. Actually, we'll start in verse 8. It says, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the... You see, all those offerings for sin, they, they didn't accomplish it. That, that did not please God. Well, then why did he have them do it? <clears throat> it was a shadow. It was to, to get them into the, the mindset and, and understanding that. You say, well, that, that's strange. No, it's not. We have kids play with all kinds of things before they get old enough to actually have the real thing. We even let teenagers drive with their parents before they get their license. <laughs> Whoever thought of that idea was a really smart person. Amen. <laughs> we, we say, and we, and, and we let them drive smaller things uh, until they get ready to, to drive uh, the bigger things. Uh, Elliot was driving the mower. He uh, got his little mower and... and and he'd been on before, and, but uh, I walked around the house and Courtney's watching him. He's just going in circle and circle and circle. He's blowing all the grass in and he's got the deck so low that now he can't drive over the mound of grass that he's created. And Courtney's like, stop him, go get him before he scalps the whole yard. He's smiling with braces as big as can be, you know. Uh, he's learning how. Now, we, we raised the deck, we got over that, but... Hey, I hope he learns how so dad don't have to mow the yard anymore. Amen, right? The, the, the picture here of the law, the sacrifices, they didn't pay for sin, but they would get us ready to, for the final payment. Look at Hebrews 10, 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Would you read these last three words with me? Once. That's what it says. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Remember I talked about in the beginning, Jesus was better better sacrifices. That, that's what Hebrews is describing. It only took one. One sacrifice was it. That's why he sat down. Hebrews 10, 12 says, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, he didn't sit down until he had offered the sacrifice. And that shows us the importance of him being seated. He accomplished it by himself, 
It was after he offered it. And look at verse, look at verse 12. How long does it last? It lasts forever. This meant after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And so seeing Jesus seated at the right hand would help us to understand that there's nothing else I can offer for my sin. Yes, if you're struggling with your salvation, it's that simple. What struggle could you do to accomplish it? You either have it or you don't. He's either given it or you ain't got it because you're not going to earn it or keep it or hold on to it. It must be God and God alone. And Jesus is that one that accomplished it, seated. Thirdly, we see him staying there. Now, I just mentioned Stephen saw him standing, but he just stood to, uh, for whatever, uh, uh, for recognition or, uh, or just a... Uh, um, uh, to uh, let Stephen uh, see that, that he was being watched and what he was doing. For whatever personal reason that happened, I don't have the, the exact answer. But he's staying in that seat. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 says, He's staying there expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. So Christ is going to be at the right hand of the Father <coughs> until... Something else happens until his enemies be made his footstool. That footstool is a reference of a conqueror putting his foot on top of the person he has conquered in battle. And I, almost like David and Goliath stands over the dead body, puts his foot and says, I won. David took da uh, Goliath's sword and chopped off his head. Jesus will put his foot on the throat of his enemies and the earth will become the footstool of the Lord and that's what he's waiting until that day he'll be staying on the throne. <clears throat> I believe that he will come off the throne to receive us into glory. The Bible says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. means we're not going to go in front of them, before them. They'll rise, and then we'll rise with them. And we'll meet the one that sits on the throne, meet him in the air. Can I tell you this? There's a really important truth there. Jesus is our high priest, and he's been interceding for us while he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But when the rapture call comes, all of that work is done, and he comes to meet us because he doesn't have to stay seated to intercede. He's receiving us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. What an awesome picture. And so he stays on the throne while his enemies, until they're made his footstool, until every believer is called home to heaven. And until then, he'll be staying on the throne. Once we get to heaven, he'll come back and take his place on David's throne. He'll no longer have to be the priest, and then he'll become the potentate, the king. And he'll rule and reign as king of kings and lord of lords on David's throne. Those are the points at which he'll get off that seated throne at the right hand of the Father. Can somebody say amen, right? That's, a, that's, a, that's awesome. That's what's going to happen. Uh, don't, don't worry about the missiles and the bombing and, and all those things. Uh, although I, I do think it's uh, quite ironic that 300 missiles were fired from Iran and there's no damage from them in Israel. Amen. What a miracle. What a miracle. To hear it from Iran's point of view, we conquered Israel. Not one of them hit, buddy. That's like punching Mike Tyson 50 times and never hitting him once in the air. Yeah, I threw 50 punches. I didn't hit him once. I won. You'd be lucky if you just got out there with your ear on your head, right? But that's another, another story. You didn't win. It's a miracle. And then we see that all the things going on in the world, we know the ending of those things will be Jesus taking a place in Jerusalem and ruling and reigning from that land. And so he's, not only is he seen, not only is he seated, He's staying, and finally, let's see what he's stating when he takes that seat. There are some ceremonies that when the person takes a seat, then there, there's something stated. Sometimes in weddings, uh, when, when everybody, when the bride gets in place, then the guests are seated. Uh, the, the mother of the bride stands, and everyone else stands, and then she's seated, and there's some, there's some symbolism of those things. When Jesus is seated, there's a great statement, and I've tried to describe some of it, but go with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, 
verse number 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. And we're in chapter 8, which was before chapter 10. You know what he offered. He offered himself. But that's why it was one offering. He's a priest. And a priest would be one who would go in between God and the person to intercede or to mediate on their behalf. So the person would bring the sacrifice and the priest would say, I'll take that, I'll offer it to God because you cannot go into the presence of God. Does that make sense? <clears throat> when Christ takes his spot at the right hand of the Father, he is taking his spot as our high priest. He goes in between God and man to reconcile us together. He is our high priest, and a high priest is a high position. It's the seat right hand of the Father. What a, what a, a, a great, great authority and picture. I, I don't know what that chair looks like, but I would suggest that it's got to be of the, the, the highest price and the highest uh, um, uh, character and cost of anything. It wouldn't be a folding Costco chair. It would be a, a, a chair worthy of the one sitting upon it, the high priest. Uh, uh, Br Brian was teasing. He said, boy, after we get all this renovation done, this place is going to be too fancy for me to come here. And uh, I hope that we can make this place beautiful. I hope that it would be honoring to God uh, as people come in. You all say amen? amen. But you know what makes this place beautiful? It's the people in it, not the paint on it. Amen. Because we had the same, the same need and the same uh, evidence at the other building. When you came in the other building, those lights, those shades were, were tipped up instead of tipped down because we used them for two purposes. They lit up the room and they catch the rain when it dripped from the, from the ceiling. <laughs> so we had glass globes that were like this. I said, we want them down over here. I'm not catching no more water. And you come in sometimes and there was fish in the, the lights just swimming around there. Uh, I don't know how it didn't blow up a circuit breaker, but you know the, the building wasn't what drew people. It was the beauty of what was in the building. And that's the same thing here. I don't care what, what it looks like. Listen, Christian, if, you, if you've got an ugly spirit, our church is going to be ugly. Yeah. If, if you've got a, a horrible attitude, our church will have a horrible spirit. Uh, there has to be that, that constant uh, fervency of, of the members and of the people to make the church beautiful, not the maintenance and the contractors. That's not going to be the result. And so what is he stating? It's a high priest, it's a high position, and then look, it's a high purpose. Go to Romans chapter 8, and I'll be done. Romans chapter 8. What is being stated as Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father? He's our high priest. Obviously, he would be close to the, uh, to the throne so that we could get to God through the man, Christ Jesus. Well, will Jesus always be the man? No, at the very end, when all the kingdoms are delivered up, God will be one and one and all the same. <clears throat> it will, I would say go right back to in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That, that's, what, that's what will happen when all of this uh, purpose uh, of, of the, the short time that we are experiencing on this earth is, is culminated. Romans chapter 8, verse number 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even, look at this, verse 34, who is even at the right hand of God, who also, what? Maketh intercession for us. That's his purpose. The reason that he's seated is he is our high priest interceding on our behalf. What do you mean interceding? 
Oh, he's the only way we got to get to God. And it's his offering that is in God's sight acceptable so we can get to God. Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I just drop a microphone right there? Paul, drop the Bible. What else needs to be said? He's our high priest. He's for us. Who can bring anything against us? Because it's all been paid. He's staying on the seat, interceding. Friend, if you don't know that peace, you need to know Jesus right now. And if you've got that peace, then you need to worship Him and have a reason to serve Him because of what He's already done for you. Can somebody say amen? amen. That's the one seated on the throne. Oh, it is a powerful sermon. To realize that Jesus could sit down because He's accomplished it all. To realize I can rest because He has my case. He's taken it and He's fully taken care of it. Uh, that, that's a, a wonderful, wonderful confidence when you know someone's got your case and they're taking it to the judge for you. And you say, well, I'm really worried about it. Yeah, but I got this lawyer and he knows the judge. We're going to get things worked out. Jesus is the judge and the lawyer. He's going to get things worked out. And so you can rest because he's seated on the throne. Oh, I pray that, that you'll be seated in heavenly places with him. Ephesians tells us that. And if you have Christ as your Savior... Marvel at the, uh, the message. Uh, revel in what's been, how we've been redeemed. Be excited about what has been accomplished uh, from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then when you see Him seated, you can know the work's done. He saved my soul. Now I can live out of love for Him because He's accomplished and paid the price. I know that uh, uh, in... In certain situations, we can take relationships for granted. I, I can uh, sense that even in close relationships. Husband, wife, father, child, uh, uh, siblings, and, and those things. But don't take the relationship that you have with Jesus for granted. When you see him seated, it's not because he's tired. It's because he's done. And it's because he's staying there to intercede until he steps out to call us home. Every head bowed, every eye closed, ask you a moment of just quiet introspection. Friend, if you're here this morning, and without a doubt in your heart and your mind, you know that you can look when the brightness of God's sun shone and shined into your heart. I mentioned in the early service, and I forgot to say it, but boy, that eclipse that happened the other day, uh, I, I'll never forget that point of light as the moon started to go on the other side of the sun. And it just broke through and just a piercing brightness that you could just see the beginning of that. Oh, do you remember when you got saved and the light of the Lord Jesus shine in your life? If you've been saved, you'll remember that moment. You'll know when you confessed him as Lord and Savior. Friend, if you have that testament, would you raise your hand as the piano begins to play? You've got that set on your heart. What a blessing. You can put it down. You can put it down. If you're here and you say, well, I don't know when I've been born again. I'm not sure if I can remember that point of which the light, the brightness of God shone in my life. I, I don't know if he's, I've never seen him seated. I, I'm worried that I'm still uh, in danger of, of eternity.